Good evening, everybody. Um, I just wanted, before we start, I wanted to mention um, Ray Kadingo, a Morea board member who recently passed away. Um, he started a tree planting group, not, not only as something that's good for the earth, but also, also as a way for uh, people to get to know each other. And uh, this past weekend, in honor of Ray, several Morea members, along with members of Burke's Nature, uh, planted 10 native trees. I believe it was uh, oak, red oak trees, uh, dogwoods, and red buds. Anyway, these trees were planted in honor of Ray um, at Kernsville Dam, which is at the base of uh, the Blue Mountain near Hamburg, Pennsylvania. Um, we were also fortunate to have Ray's daughter join us. Uh, beautiful site. Um, I've been there many times. It, it overlooks a wetland. Uh, there's a, a new beaver lodge there. And of course, it's at the base of the mountain. So um, next step, we hope to have a, a small memorial uh, plaque put there in honor of Ray. So uh, coming up um, next month, we have a presentation from a Philadelphia entrepreneur who took the, uh, the idea of green jobs seriously and actually cr has created I don't know the number, but a lot of uh, solar installation jobs. He's, he's trained hundreds of solar installers, thousands actually, according to this, thousands in high school vocational and job training programs. Um, he'll be our speaker. Um, not only will he be talking about how he did that, but also he'll be talking about Pennsylvania policy on solar. Um, he'll be talking about what we should be doing to advoc advocate for more solar to make it more available for everyone. And uh, interestingly, he's also working on creating blocks of uh, individual solar installations uh, to create economies to scale and actually create uh, distributed energy generation. Um, so it'll be very interesting. So that's the end of May, May 25th. And then in June, um, we have uh, Karen Campbell. She lives in southeastern Pennsylvania and uh, on a four acre parcel, uh, she converted it along with her uh, engineer husband partner um, into a native plant haven for pollinators. Um, very, looks very interesting. She has beautiful photography. Um, if you wanna check it out ahead of time, of course, go to our website uh, or she has a website focus on natives.com. Very nice. Um, with that, uh, Chuck, you wanna to introduce tonight's speakers? Uh, I, actually, I was gonna do that. Okay, sorry, Phil. No problem. Um, Tonight we have two speakers. Uh, Bill Hennessy is one of Morea's earliest organizers. Uh, he's been an early and a long time solar and re renewable energy pioneer, uh, a NABCEP certified installer, now retired, teacher and advocate. Uh, he'll be joined by Bruce Hankins, who's a retired master electrician, veteran solar contractor and Bill's longtime work partner. Bill, Bruce, and Vera Cole have taught many solar workshops at universities and community colleges across the state and as part of many home installs. Many solar installers in Pennsylvania and neighboring states gained their initial training from Bill, Bruce, and Vera. So tonight, tonight, we have a rare treat. Bill and Bruce will be sharing with you their latest solar plus storage, adding, adding storage to solar. <laughs> Either way. Okay. Okay, Phil. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Bill Hennessy, and this is uh, Bruce Hankins, mm -hmm. and uh, we hope to, uh, you know, go through, we've got a, a about 45 minute meeting and uh, just kind of show you what, uh, how storage is an important part of uh, really going to all renewables and meeting all our, our uh, climate change uh, goals. Uh, okay. Now, the one thing though we do have to talk about is uh, before is that if we look into the to the world of solar energy, there, there's two different parts of it. There's decarbonization. We'll, we'll be using the bud, buzzwords, uh, which you know is basically what the Biden administration is looking at and proposing. And then there's uh, resiliency, which is uh, what we're trying to do uh, when there's, uh, uh, you know, things like Hurricane Sandy, uh, California wildfires, uh, Texas, the big freeze, and and they're they're both solar, but they're they're two uh, two completely different 
things. And, and what we're going to be looking at uh, today is mostly uh, resiliency, what, what you can do in individuals and what you can do uh, in a microgrid, uh, small local uh, community uh, setup, kind of like what they're uh, going to be talking about next month. And, uh, we've got a couple examples here. But, uh, okay, so just real quick, uh, it just in terms of a scale of what we're talking about, okay, uh, decarbonization, you look at things like uh, the Roadrunner Solar in Texas. They've got over a million solar panels, and what they can do is they can handle about 100,000 homes. Uh, outside of, uh, in the North Sea, outside of uh, the UK, they've got an offshore wind, and they can handle four and a half million homes. So, you know, just, just in terms of where things are going to be going, wind is, offshore wind is really going to be the dominant part in decarbonization. And then if we look uh, real quickly down towards, uh, and this is something we can thank our frackers for, is that they've uh, actually learned how to drill the really deep depths. They have to work on uh, handling the heat when you get down there but you can uh, basically come up with, uh, you know, using that technology and uh, traditional small scale uh, steam turbines, we could end up, you know, with enough uh, energy in small places to uh, meet the world's needs without uh, any downsides like nuclear nor taking up a lot of space like the, uh, like the solar or the, the higher cost of going offshore with wind. So that, that's, uh, you know, where you want to look at decarbonization, which, you know, you just got to remember that the solar panels, they're, they're great for resiliency, but they're not going to solve our, our bigger issue of uh, heating up the earth. I would just like to add on that, these large scale utility, utility scale systems, the power that they generate is by its very nature going to have to be delivered by the grid. Which brings us to our next slide. And uh, yeah, so again, you know, then if the grid goes down, what are you going to do? And you know, you're you're going to have, uh, you know, the decarbonization plan isn't going to work. So uh, we need what you know. The other buzzword for tonight is resiliency, and uh, basically that's that's to be able to adjust to these uh, situations and. Uh, you know, keep some level of, uh, of comfort, or in the case of even Texas, where people were actually freezing, uh, you know, survival in, uh, in that. So, uh, so both both of these systems, uh, you know, what we talk about with resilient with resiliency, well, we need uh, we need battery backup for that. So, uh, let's, let's go on here. And uh, okay, so so about in this this we're just going to kind of go to a little example here. And uh, hopefully bring it out to uh, you know the bigger parts of microgrids. So uh, ten years ago, we put in uh, 40 solar panels in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. It was a grid tied, no storage system, about uh, 9.6 kilowatts. So, so you want to talk about this, Bruce? Sure. Okay, this system. What we're discussing here is individual resiliency. This is what you need to be resilient is <clears throat> for a system to be resilient, you need to make the power on site. That's what we're looking at here is a photovoltaic solar power generator, one in the field and one on the roof. And um, <clears throat> then the next thing you need to have a resilient system and individual resiliency is you need to have. Um, energy storage. Now these are the in inverters that draw the electricity from the modules and deliver it into the batteries and then draw from the batteries and deliver to the loads that you deem essential. So resilient systems have their power on site, the power generation on site and their energy storage on site. Okay, and then uh, real quick, and this happens, I'm sure a lot of you folks are, are aware of this and you just kind of 
want to go over it, but I, you often see even people that are in the industry get a little sloppy about it. And and when we talk about power and we talk about energy, they're, uh, they're, they're related, but they're not the same. You can't really interchange them. And uh, just a real quick example, because uh, this will be important as we go down further on, a uh, power is just like the rating of the light bulb. It could be a LED, a six watt bulb or a hundred watt bulb, but that's that's the power, whether it's on or off, that's, that's what it's rated for. Now energy actually has the time factor involved. So if the bulb's lit for a certain amount of time, then that's the watt hours or the kilowatt hours. And so, and power is strictly in, in watts or kilowatts. So again, just, uh, just kind of want to go over that distinction. So, okay, Elon, Elon, batteries first. Okay, there's um, basic, three basic battery types found in the home backup systems. <clears throat> Two, really, but acid, lead acid based batteries, flooded lead acid and AGN. Uh, the nice thing about flooded acid, lead acid is they're durable and they can be abused. You can get your settings slightly wrong. You can overcharge them a little bit or undercharge them a little bit. They, they're, they're durable. But the thing is they require maintenance. AGM and gel batteries are also lead acid batteries, but they don't require any maintenance. That's the main difference between the two. <clears throat> okay, and then the, the new the new one. Go ahead. Now the new kid in town is the lithium. Well, I don't know if he's really the new kid in town anymore. Lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries. <clears throat> their advantage is their energy density. Because of their energy density, they can be a lot smaller and they can put out a lot more power. Just to give you an example, in 2011, a lead acid battery energy density was 40 watt hours per kilogram, per kilogram of weight of the battery, where a lithium's energy density was 200. That's in 2011, as of 2021, Lithium batteries have improved so much that their energy energy densities are running from 260 watt hours for a kilogram to all the way up to 420 watt hours per kilogram. So these have a lot more storage capacity for the size than lead acid. And you can cycle them all the way down where a lead acid could only take down to like 80%. So this is a, a vast improvement. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, a couple of things. Uh, the lithium ion is just, you know, with, along with the AGM, there are no maintenance, which is really good for, for residential use. There is a, really a big recycling issue with the lithium ions. I mean, people talk here and there about them, but, but nobody is doing it on a regular scale uh, or coming up with anything on how to recycle uh, lithium ion and how to uh, sort out some of the, the rare uh, uh, elements that are in it. So that's something that, that I think really needs to be addressed. And if you look at lead acid, uh, basically 100% of a lead acid battery, a lead acid battery. Can, uh, can be recycled. And, and the lithium for the power density, uh, you're going to be paying a lot more for it too. Maybe uh, at this uh, time while well, it costs are all over. But here's so, okay, and the then, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. yeah, oh okay. This is what we uh, we installed for the, the folks in, uh, in near Lenhardsville. It was a, a simplify lithium ion battery. You want to talk on that a little bit? Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the advantage of the lithium batteries. <clears throat> One advantage of them is typically with lead acid, the batteries are 12 volt batteries. And 
what you want to do in a household system is you want to increase the voltage to 48 volts because the higher your volts, the less amperage you're carrying. Smaller wire, smaller equipment, everything is directly related to that amperage. So these are 48 volts per battery instead of four having to be wired together to get that. So you can you can get a lot more uh, kilowatt hours into the same space. Plus they have a better wiring hookup because they don't have to be have a series strings to build voltage. They're all hooked in parallel which gives the less issues during charging and discharging with uh, batteries. With lead acid, if you have one bad, bad, bad battery in the line, it affects the whole line. These are all sort of standalone, parallel, connected. So that's another advantage of a lithium battery. Yeah, we, we can't see it in the, the picture here, but each battery has its own little uh, management system and circuit breaker. And uh, one another downside about the lithium though is is uh, okay. This is in a barn, uh, unheated barn, and uh, the the batteries will work when you go below uh, 32 degrees, but they they won't charge. And so uh, what you have to do at, at that you can damage the batteries. And you know here we're looking at you know twenty three thousand dollars worth of batteries. So you really want to pay attention to that. So. Uh, what we did in the lower left-hand corner is uh, there's a little, they'll call it an enclosure heater. It's a little uh, electric uh, resistance heater and it's, you know, powered by the battery. So there won't be any type of, uh, you know, if, if the grid goes down, the batteries will, will still stay warm. And then on the, the upper right side, the, in that little black box, there's a, a little device called a temp stick that actually, uh, connects to the Wi-Fi and can relay to your phones what the actual temperature is in the, in the battery cabinet at the time. So they, you can, uh, you know, keep an eye on it that way. And then if it, if it drops down to uh, 40 degrees or so, you can set an alarm that you'll get an email and be notified that, you know, there's an issue and you got to uh, either shut off the inverters so you don't go into a charge mode with the, with the batteries. And uh, again, the, these batteries here, uh, we can see that there's a couple of different, you know, at the beginning, the storage here is uh, 30 kilowatt hours, but then we can pull a maximum amount of power of about uh, 15 and a half uh, kilowatts. Uh, uh, so that's how much uh, power we can, you know, draw at one time. And the kilowatt hours is how much the life of the batteries as in keeping things running. Anything else on that? Uh, let's look at the next slide. Oh, okay. So here's a, a Tesla, which is you know really got all the all the um, attention these days. Uh, the, the power wall, and then they have a, a gateway, which is the transfer switch needed to connect for it. Uh, you know, you look at. Uh, there's a couple things with the Tesla that are, that are a little different with the, the Simplify. The maximum power on a Tesla is only five kilowatts. And I think we were at about 15 kilowatts on the Simplify. And the energy for a one Tesla power wall is about 13 and a half. And so if, if you look at, you know, going out a little further equivalent amounts, We've got maybe uh, thirty thousand, a little more than thirty thousand uh, dollars into a power wall versus the simplify. And what was the energy output of the system? Uh, output 30, 30 kilowatt hours. Yeah. So, okay. I would like to talk about <clears throat> the en the importance of the energy density of these, the size of these batteries, a little more. Um, we actually store a lot of energy right now, but we store it as gasoline. So gasoline tanks, propane tanks, and those things like that, they sort of set the standard for how much space is required for energy storage and how much it should cost and how much it should last. 
As we increase our energy density, well, as energy density is increased with these batteries and they get smaller and smaller, then we get closer and closer to the standard that people are willing to accept. I just wanted to sure. Yeah. Okay, so so in the the, the chemistry of, of the batteries, uh, the Tesla has a cobalt in it, and the Simplify has has a iron oxide. Is that it? Yeah. right? Yeah. So there's a little different chemistry in, in the batteries, and what's what's interesting is that. Uh, in the world court right now, there's a couple groups suing uh, folks like Apple and uh, Tesla for, uh, you know, they're kind of slack. Most of the cobalt mining uh, is uh, done in uh, Congo, and uh, a lot of it's done by children. They have about 35,000 children mining for uh, cobalt for uh, lithium ion batteries at this time. And, uh, I think we went back a little bit and looked, and uh, around the turn of the century, they had about 12,000 children working in Pennsylvania coal mines. So it's, uh, things have not gotten any better in some level. So we're going to go on now and say, okay, well, we've got our, what are we going to have to have for our resilient system? You want to talk about this one? Okay. For our resilient system, you're going to need to store your energy. You're going to need to actually have be able to produce some of your energy on site. You'll need the inverters to manage the electricity. And what that management involves is it involves isolating from the grid when you need to. It uh, involves isolating your critical, your essential loads from your non-essential loads. When you're running off of batteries, you need to pare down the amount of power you're using. And this is done with load shed. Sometimes we have dedicated panels, load panels. But anyway, the you have to isolate, you have to do those isolating functions. And so that's that's the component, the main components of a resilient system. It has to be standalone. It has to be able to stand alone when it's not connected to the grid. Yeah, and then you know you look at it and folks say, okay, well, is it worth it? You know, what do I need to do if the if the power goes out for well, like up here we lost uh, power for about five or six days after uh, Hurricane Sandy. And uh, you know we have we have a battery backup system, and uh, you know we were able to get by. We had lights, refrigeration, uh, water from the well, and uh, uh, so that you know basically it, you know it was fairly warm, so it met our met our energy needs at the time. But you know if you're looking at these systems, is it it's really a form of insurance? And then you say, okay, well, how much money are we spending on premiums, or how much? Do we, want to spend and you know if you ask the folks in Texas a couple months ago I'm sure they were ready to, to have an insurance policy on that so and then you know we kind of look at you know okay well what's what's a reasonable amount of uh, battery storage oh okay so if we look at, at uh, this area of Pennsylvania our average electric bill is about hundred and twenty dollars a month and it, it's going to buy us about 30 kilowatt hours of, of energy uh, per day. And so we looked at our, our battery storage systems and they'll range from 10 to 30 kilowatt hours. And, uh, you know, again, that's, that's just the batteries for the cost. And then, you know, your inverters and solar panels are extra. And, uh, the other thing we touched on, we're going to go back to a little bit, is the when you, you start up your motor, say for a well pump or a septic uh, system, or even uh, like an old nasty refrigerator, uh, you're going to need extra power to handle that surge. And uh, that's another spot where the, the Tesla could use a little improvement. Uh, the simplifies, I think, had about three times the, uh, the starting power in that. 
And then, uh, but you know, we look at, at what our average is, and uh, you know, is averaging about 25 kilowatt hours a day in in during winter. But then, you know, if you get into some some cloudy, snowy January weather, you're only going to get maybe five and a half kilowatt hours, and your your house is using uh, about ten and a half kilowatt hours. So you've got the grid is making up the difference in that. Um, okay. Yeah, I just want to point out the grid made the difference, made up the difference. Uh, these resilient systems, there's sort of a tendency right now with the lot to think of the grid as the enemy. <laughs> Some people think that way, but really the grid is an important part of the resilient system. And, you know, if we look at, at the grid, it's like the the, the biggest battery you could ever imagine. So you, you're going to be doing okay until it fails. Okay. So, uh, you know, if, if we go back to that last slide and then say, okay, well, you, you have to make up the difference if you, uh, you know, you run off your batteries, but if your batteries aren't being charged after three or four days, then you're going to need a backup to the backup. And uh, in this case, it was uh, a propane power generator. So hopefully the times will, will never uh, require that. But if, if it gets uh, a really you know, tight situation, you're, you're down for a long time, you know, this, this, this will happen. Yeah. Notice, uh, notice the picture of the energy storage there for the generator. Okay. But you know, the generator runs on gas and uh, small generators from Home Depot run on gas. And as you can see it brought out the crowds anyways, just trying to get some kind of a, a refill to stay warm and, uh, you know, keep a few lights on, charge your phone. So, and the other, the other part to, to realize too is that uh, where, where the utilities and the grid are, are failing us is that the infrastructure spending has really gone down with deregulation. That there, there's there's less support for a, a grid and there's, there's you know you have to fight a lot for uh, these questions of resiliency and micro uh, microgrids. There's uh, a lot of work that really needs to be done and it's going to have a cost too. But uh, you know we're all everybody's just kind of looking at uh, how low is my electric bill? How high is it? And, you know, we look at here in Pennsylvania, we're doing 15 cents a kilowatt hour, somewhere in there. California, the time of use, they're doing 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So if we uh, look ahead, we, we don't see a lot of, uh, you know, good output, outlooks for, for uh, keeping electric, electricity costs down. Anything like that? Okay. So the thing we wanted to, to get into, and this is really the heart of what we're talking about, is that you know resiliency is great when you have uh, you know your small isolated system, but you know we showed okay you've got generators needing to back up if you've got some bad weather, and so where you can go with that is that you can uh, you can have what what we'll call a microgrid where it's uh, offering. Uh, more options for, for everybody if we look in uh, small groups. Let's see if we have a, there we go. Okay, go ahead, Bruce. Okay. <clears throat> what the microgrid is really how it's different from individual resilient an uh, individual resilient system is an individual resilient system has its power production on site and its storage on site. <clears throat> where that doesn't apply to people who like live in apartments, for example, they're gonna have a hard time doing that. But with a microgrid, what you can do is you can have energy storage for each individual, each apartment could have their own energy storage, and you could have a community shared distributed power input. You could have a solar array built as part of the complex. And then the grid 
you don't have to disconnect from the grid at each individual location. You can disconnect from the larger grid at a location that leaves everybody else connected, like say for the whole apartment complex. This would, and then what you would do is <clears throat> everybody could share the distributed power resource that's there to help keep their batteries going. So, yeah, again, just do I go over what's the microgrid showing yeah. there? Does this work here? I'll try it. Okay. Okay, this is a. Uh, uh, can you go back? Yeah. This is a pretty good picture of a microgrid. I like this one a lot. What I want to point out is I would like to point out. This is the microgrid, and here it's disconnected from the larger grid, and it's going to stand alone. Look at some of the components that are here, inputs. You have a power input from your solar and a power input from your wind. Over here, there's an engine generator. So those are power inputs that are basically on site. You have energy storage. You've got energy storage and batteries. They got the energy storage. Here they're showing in the electric car. There's some that's a definite possibility, although there are some problems. Here's the loads, different load profiles. It could be an individual home or it could be the apartments that we're talking about. Here's the network that's going to make all of this work together, the communication network, and some of these. Decisions that this network makes to be decided by preset prices, price controls, or weather. Weather could be an example of weather. There's a heat wave coming. So instead of the grid delivering all the power during the heat wave, they could draw from some from the batteries too to supplement that power to keep the pressure off the grid. Or if you had a snowstorm, and your solar panels were covered with snow and not delivering, the grid could prioritize delivery because they know that <clears throat> the distributed power source that you're typically relying on there is not producing at the time. The best of all scenarios is if microgrids were connected to other microgrids. This would be the ultimate in resiliency. You can have a and a completely adaptable uh, grid network that way. Okay, here's a, a picture of a, a thousand home uh, microgrid in Chicago that's uh, basically come online uh, just recently. It uh, was with the utility uh, Commonwealth Edison, and uh, they have in uh, one section it, it, it was, uh, you know, housing. Uh, standalone or townhouses and then we have uh, apartments and then they have schools for training people talking to people uh, and then they have a battery uh, battery backup system they have uh, actually they brought a generator on site now to natural gas powered that will uh, be selling to the grid you know to help uh, pay for, pay for some of this uh, they're actually part of the uh, PJM connection, uh, which is the same, uh, you know, overseer of the grid that we have here in Pennsylvania and on the East Coast. It stretches as far as Chicago. Yeah. I just wanted to use a little more detail on the same thing you mm -hmm. just said. That last picture that we had, you can see it fleshed out here. Here's their microgrid storage, which is probably the batteries. And over here, they have an EV mobility pilot. I'm thinking they're using the batteries in their fleet or whatever as a energy storage. Here's their community solar. Here's their protected infrastructure for public safety where people can go. So everything that was on the picture before is shown somewhere in this plot layout. And here's here's actually what, what it looks like. Uh, you can see uh, 
all the apartments have uh, about you know have solar panels on the roof, and then there's uh, the batteries are in the background, and and basically there's about a thousand uh, uh, residential units in this in this area here that are under this microgrid. Okay, so then here we're coming back to a uh, 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 development that they're doing in Allentown right now that's a non-microgrid. You want to talk about this, Bruce? <clears throat> yeah, um, I was looking at the, uh, I was driving by it. This is close to where I live. I was looking at it <clears throat> and I was thinking what these boxes are here, I was an electrician for many years, is a place where the, the utility line comes in here and it plugs in on one side and then it, go, it, and then it plugs in on the other and goes out. So it's a disconnection point. And I was thinking, this is the kind of place where you could install something that would separate the from the larger grid, a point like this. And <clears throat> so that's one thing there, that there's points where they can do the disconnection to isolate microgrids from the larger grid. And they're already, it's not that difficult to do. This is where they have their electrical meeting, uh, metering inside here. And um, we're looking at some of the battery packages, the battery bank packages. Um, currently, the sizes that we were talking about, a footprint would be, for the battery bank for an individual apartment, would be something like 22 inches wide, 10 inches deep, about five foot eight tall. So it'd mount on your bathroom door pretty nice. But they could mount battery systems out here and, and enclose them, or Better yet would be to have them in each individual apartment. The closer you can get to where they're being used, the better for wiring purposes. Also, as I drove around <clears throat> this apartment complex, not everything shown here, they had lawns, they had wetlands, they had all kinds of uh, space dedicated to the site. And one of those spaces that they could add in there is they could put in community-owned solar or whatever's available in that area. So these apartments, they actually lend themselves to microgrids. They're, what, they're one of the best applications, actually. Yeah, you could have uh, basically put solar on every uh, building roof and uh, have solar power ports and... Uh, you know, really uh, make a contribution to, to the overall energy needs of the group. And then uh, this, is, this is what would happen if, if you had a, a really long extended outage. Or, uh, okay, the, when, you're, when you go on to battery power, basically the way that it works out right now, cost-wise, and the, what's available is you can power your lights, receptacles, you can power, help me here, refrigerator, refrigerator yeah. uh, items, a microwave, things like that, but item, there's some items that you don't want to draw from your battery because it just would drain it too fast. It would be like a stove or a hot water heater, hot water heater, a heat pump, anything like that. So heating and cooking would probably, except for maybe in a microwave, would not be a good idea. But what you could do is most of these um, complexes have a clubhouse. They call it a clubhouse. Right now they have a swimming pool. But they could have a commercial kitchen. You could have a place where people could go to cook. And only in a crisis, uh, just to be prepared for a crisis situation. So a, a common area that has better energy storage is a good idea for resiliency. Okay. Now, you know, you say, oh, these are kind of silly things to be talking about, but uh, you look in, in uh, okay, California right now, they, uh, this year they started requiring uh, 
solar on the uh, only residences uh, under four stories tall. And to encourage storage, uh, where, where you can reduce the amount of solar panels on your uh, new construction uh, if you uh, put in a battery storage system. And then if you add some energy efficiencies, you can get a, a further reduction in the requirements of the uh, energy storage. But what, what's happened too that's, that's kind of in, in goes along with this is uh, right now in California with all the problems they had the uh, last couple of years with wildfires and uh, rolling blackouts and you know transmission lines being burned down, is about 50% uh, of all the uh, installations in California now have uh, some form of battery storage. Now, they still haven't reached the, you know, the part where the utilities have to help cooperate with microgrids, but uh, the batteries are being, uh, folks are loading up on them for uh, resiliency, just because, uh, you know, basically the, the fires are killing people. Anything in yeah, also I'd like to talk about California and this situation. It's not only um, these systems are not only important for resiliency for standing alone, but these systems also also can work with the grid. You can do all kinds of grid services when they're connected to the grid. They can provide um, load leveling. They can provide voltage support. There's all kinds of things that they can do to help the grid. So they're not only for standalone, but they're to um, facilitate the operation of the grid. Okay. So if we do, uh, if we combine our microgrids, our storage, and our large solar farms, or wind farms, uh, basically you're going to uh, they have a study that just came out in December, where they uh, were running a, a lot of uh, a lot of modeling on it. And you know, the, the usual thinking is, uh, you know, large solar farms are the way to go. And uh, you know, if you look at what's happening in Pennsylvania, the governors come up with ways to uh, take over, you know, large parts of, of farming with uh, and in the land with uh, you know the big solar farms. And you're seeing stuff in, in uh, local townships where and this is a, an issue that really cuts both ways when you've got some uh, some really good farmland that uh, you know, people are wanting to, to lease the farmland for solar uh, for solar farms. And you look at uh, maybe uh, you rent your land out and you can get $100, $150 an acre for farming and the uh, solar people are paying about a thousand thousand dollars an acre annually for the solar farm. So there's a, a big gap in that and, and so you're finding uh, and again it's just on a small township level. So some townships are approving these things and, and others uh, uh, our township next to us rejected one uh, which was uh, right next to Becca batteries. You know so so there, there's a lot of a uh, lot of issues that need to be taken care of, but, but, you know, if you look at, if you put in uh, with their modeling, they found, okay, if we do small local solar, uh, talking about carports, we're talking about roofs, talking about, I don't know, a million warehouses they're putting up around here, but there's probably not one solar panel on any warehouse. And then if we uh, combine that with some utility scale storage and solar, it's uh, going to give us the lowest uh, cost per minute uh, option. Um, let's see if they have it. Yeah, so this this is what they were uh, resolving in the study. Is that, uh, they said, okay, we have uh, about, uh, you know, we, we get into bigger numbers, but, you know, we've got a local rooftop community storage. We have about three times that amount in the utility storage, wind and solar. And then you have, uh, you know, based on the costs of these things, uh, we're looking at uh, maybe uh, rate payers over is that 10 years, I think, uh, you know, about uh, $500 billion. And we've cleaned up the grid. And we've also provided a couple million local jobs. That, they can't be outsourced no matter how hard they try. It's, uh, 
you got to show up to work and uh, run the wires every day. So, um, what we're, what's, what's happening again is, is that in the House of Representatives, they, uh, they started a bill to, um, to give everybody a tax credit or to give groups tax credits for uh, building these microgrids. And uh, part of it is, you know, the communities, if we look at townships or school districts, what this bill would do is instead of a tax credit, since they don't pay any taxes, is to uh, give them a direct payment. Uh, so it would help, you know, a lot of people's, uh, a lot of small municipalities and school districts uh, help take some of the burden off the, of the, you know, make their budgets a little easier to fill without uh, raising taxes. So, so again, you know, basically it's, we're all participating in this and we're all going to benefit from it. And we're going to have a better, uh, better world for uh, children and grandchildren too. So it's, it, it, it really can work, but we have to work together on it. Um, let's see if that's, okay, I guess that's it. Do uh, you have anything else, Bruce? I would like to say, I just read an article in a trade magazine I did from the IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And they had an article about in Southern California, one of the locals there is starting training on wiring for microgrids. So these things, there's a lot of movement happening right now, especially in California. So, uh, okay, I guess uh, that's all we've got, Phil. Uh, we've got some questions. Folks, yeah, uh, Chuck, and two questions, if I may. Yep, go ahead. Okay, um, when we talked about the lithium batteries, whether they be phosphate ion, whatever, versus the AM, AGM, and gel, I understand the maintenance concerns and the meantime between failure on the AGMs would be. Uh, worse, you know, because that with the cold, I, I understand a lot about that technology. The question is lifespan, because uh, when the cost of the lithium is so much greater, is the actual lifespan of the battery that they would be productive far greater to offset those costs and the uh, recycling problems with the lithium? Well, I think, you know, the big thing is, is the energy density with the lithium and the glamour issue of something being new. If, I mean, if you're looking at strictly a resiliency, uh, a backup program, uh, lifespan for the batteries really doesn't matter. If you're driving a car and charging them and discharging them every day, or if you're living off grid and charging and dis, you know, charging your battery in the day and discharging at night, the, the lifespan really becomes important. But uh, I, I, I feel just in terms of, of a battery backup uh, for resiliency that the uh, sealed lead acid, the AGMs are, are the way to go. And I, we, we had one system that was in about seven or eight years where the batteries gave up. And then uh, I've got you know, mine here and it's, it's running about 12, 12 years now. And uh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, we, we, uh, uh, losing the thought there. <laughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> now, the thing about most of the battery systems that <clears throat> that are installed, that we've installed, is uh, what's called what's loosely called the inverter. So, I mean, inverter and it's a charger, and it also provides the system isolation requirements. But what it also does is when the grid's available. Internally, it has a relay that um, bypasses the battery, the inverter and the, the battery system. So that battery effective bank effectively becomes a UPS system. So you don't have the cycling that you would have uh, in a true, like you would have in a true standalone system. So the battery life, that preserves the battery life of your batteries because they're not being cycled real hard. The problems that uh, you can get is if 
the way that they are now is if one battery has a problem, it can drag all the others down with it. That's changing with 5G because now they're coming out with products where the, the battery itself, it speaks to the inverter and it tells it what, what it needs more or less. So that's taking the human error out of some of the setup and uh, parameter settings that have to be done right now. Okay, uh, any other questions there? Yes, the second question. I? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes, the second question, when you talk about the higher voltage, for example, the 48 volt, obviously, you know, Ohm's law and all the less amperage. Um, but when you talk about changing the voltage of the batteries, must we also change the house voltage? So for example, we have the house set up with a lot of LED lighting, things like that, which is sens sensitive to these things. Or are you just talking about talking, changing the voltage where it goes down to the battery level and the rest of the house is going to run on a uh, standard 110 or something like that? Uh, yeah, you're correct. The, the higher voltage of the batteries that's desirable is desirable for keeping the DC wiring down. The batteries produce DC and it goes into the inverter where they, the inverter converts it to AC for our um, usable voltage for our usable loads. So it, the desirability of the higher voltage is just to keep the wiring size down on the DC side. Yeah, so, so basically once the uh, electricity leaves the inverter, uh, it looks just the same. Actually, it looks a little better what they would call a sine wave than uh, what the utility can be providing in some time. In other words, they'll just mix in together and you can't, you don't really tell the difference or anything. Uh, the, the battery voltage, you know, is set at 48 volts. That's just uh, an electric code uh, thing that happened years ago. And, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck with it at this point. But, uh, you know, some of uh, the bigger systems have uh, higher voltage. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Got it. Okay. So I had uh, four questions that um, that came in through the uh, through email, and the first one is a two part question, and it's my solar was installed in 2014. Is it too late to add storage? And secondly, would it be worth it to add that storage? Uh well, I don't know. We both we have some opinions that have certainly changed over time. Uh, you want to start on that, or should I? Okay, I, I'll start. Uh, when you have an existing system and you're adding storage to it, uh, unless you changed all all your wiring, it would be called AC coupling. And uh, two years ago, we made a little video on uh, AC coupling. We we got some grants for that. And as we go back through it, we find that there's one of the biggest issues is that uh, you have to add a second second inverter when you're adding the storage and that'll handle the batteries. And so you have problems with uh, one inverter, you know, working with the other inverter. And then if you need support, you call up the companies and it's real easy for them to point the finger at the other guy. So there's, a, there, you know, a, maybe, a, you know, an SMA inverter you could add their own types of inverters for storage, but that, that's probably the most expensive way you could go. And I, if we look at this uh, system that we just installed here, you want to talk about, oh yeah, okay, I'll get the picture there. Go ahead. Yeah, this is one of the things that is, I think very hopeful that we've seen in the last few years what Bill's talking about used to, if you if you have solar, you probably have a utility interactive system. With, when you want to add storage, you would have to put in a battery-based inverter. They have to be compatible for working with each other. But the new line of products, such as the what we installed in this last system, the grid-tied inverter functions and the battery-based inverter functions are all in one package. Of course, if you already have a grid-tied inverter, well, then you've got an extra grid-tied inverter. Yeah. 
which is exactly what happened here. They've, they've got a spare now. Yeah, on the on the right, you can't see it in the picture, but the, we decommissioned the uh, existing inverter, which was, you know, it was working fine, but it, it could not provide the uh, the uh, battery backup that it needed. And actually, some inverter companies were not even uh, wanting you to provide battery backup to it. So it's a it's a tough question, and you know, the more I worked with it, or the more we worked with it, the more we thought, man, this is really a good thing to stay away from. And uh, you know, but it's uh, it you know tricky to make it work, and then you know tricky to maintain. It. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to just add to that. Bill and I were discussing this trend at one time, and <clears throat> he said to me, you know, Bruce, we're not the beginning. Or the end, or the end, and what he meant was we're the end of the custom systems. What we, what Bill used to do is a solar contractor, but really it was an integrator. He would take different inverters, different modules, different batteries, different disconnects, all different brands, and you'd have to put them together and build a system that was basically customized for the site. Now it's becoming more like buying an automobile. You'll buy solar, for instance, looking at this picture. And in the solar is the grid tied inverter, is the <clears throat> battery based inverter, is all the DC and AC breakers and the generator inputs. And it performs all the isolation and it's all in one package. So the days of the custom-made system basically are starting to come to an end, and there'll be packages produced by one company. Yeah, if you look at this, you know, when they started the PCs, people would actually go and have their computer built for them by somebody, and and you know that just never happens anymore. And uh, actually, Tesla yesterday announced that they're going to be installing. Uh, batteries with uh, every uh, Tesla system they put in for home power. So, uh, you know, this, this, uh, you know, the, this is, this is the direction it's going to try to keep the cost down and to, uh, you know, make, try to bring solar and, and storage, which is so important to uh, everybody. The sun still doesn't shine at night. Uh, so and to, to simplify in the answer to the question, um, she can keep her solar panels and use them, but she, she has to replace her inverter. It, it just depends. You'd have to see what the layout is and, uh, and see, okay. but it, I mean, and some guys will, you know, some folks will tell you, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, but then you got to deal with it year after year after year. So uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. One of the biggest jobs, one of the surprisingly labor intensive jobs when you do that is you've got to separate your essential circuits out from your non-essential circuits, which requires an extra load center and moving all that wiring over. Um, so there are some, you know, there are some costs that you wouldn't think about right away that are involved in doing this. And that was, uh, oh yeah, that brought up the one more thing with the Tesla setup that they're doing and, and what we set up over here was that you have a, a transfer switch that's sized for the entire load of the house and so it'll switch over so you don't need to do these separate essential circuits but at that point then you're you're the utility and you have to really manage what you use and keep keep your eye on what you're using if uh, you know you get a day with a couple of days with snow and your batteries don't get charged so, okay Okay, thanks. Chuck, do you have any questions? No. Okay, I'll just roll to the next one then. Um, I read that Toyota is developing a solid state car battery. Could this be a game changer for home energy storage as far as, as, far as peace of mind and safety? Okay, well, more than likely, the solid state battery, did you say solid state battery? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What they're talking about is uh, what we do normally think about in a battery is the electrolyte, which they're using instead, used to traditionally be liquid. 
uh, water in a, with a kind of acid, sulfuric, acid. sulfuric acid in a lead acid battery. Now they're it's a ceramic. Um, they're calling it solid state. <clears throat> so that's what they're talking about. Yeah, and uh, the other the other thing is actually, uh, you know, we look at this. Uh, well, I think there was a, a company around here uh, about 15 years ago that was trying to draw power from their, uh, you know, electric car when they were charging it, and uh, you know, there, the market was so small and, and the costs were were really high. But the, the ability is there now with the, you know, the better controls. But a lot of the car manufacturers are are pushing back and saying, well, we don't really want to do this because we're going to warranty our batteries for so many years and so many trips in your car. And really, we don't want you plug it into your house and, uh, you know, drawing it down. Or, or And, you know, again, you, you look at it and you say, well, how often do these things happen? But it, it's, there's a resistance to change is, is everywhere. So. OK, thanks. The next question, I think you answered a bit through the presentation and it was can you use solar battery storage in lieu of a backup generator oh uh yes you can i mean and that's basically what we were trying to go over on this and uh at some point though you know if, if you've run into many days of uh of no sun or snow covered modules then uh you know your batteries or they won't be recharged the next day and and so uh you know over a period of time they'll discharge it and either hopefully the grid will be back or uh you know you have a generator and you know again this isn't if we're looking strictly at costs then you say okay well you can go buy a little uh generator at home depot and uh you know, six, seven hundred dollars, and then you know you have to do some wiring if you're going to do it legally, and uh, you know you can run your loads off of that. The thing runs day and night. You're they're really polluting, and uh, you're going to need a source of fuel for it too. And you know you look at Texas and say, oh, I got natural gas, but then the the gas lines, the pumping stations freeze up. So you you can be uh, you know in terms of your your most flexibility, I, I mean, I, I, it's definitely the, the solar with the battery backups, but it's also the most expensive. Okay. Then the final question that I have is a three-parter. It's how does storage affect SRECs? Will I lose SRECs if I dump my excess into storage instead of the grid? And just to note that I'm a net metering customer. Um, okay, well, we installed, you know, over uh, over the years, you know, a lot of storage systems that have been grid tied, and you know, people have signed up for the SREX, and they, you know, we've never never seen any uh, problem at all. You know, we have to go through uh, PJM with the application, so they certainly know, you know, what's going on. But there there really hasn't been anything. I, I've heard about. Others, I think California is one place where they don't want you to, uh, but that's, you have what they call a, a time of use rate, where in the, the, the time in the late afternoon when everybody's turning on their air conditioners, the load is biggest on the grid, so they charge more money at that point for your electricity. So what they didn't want people to do was charge your batteries up at night when the rates were cheap, say from one in the you know midnight to four in the morning, and then in the afternoon take those batteries and sell back to the grid at uh, you know double what they paid in the in the in the evening. You know, it, it's a, a form of arbitrage they call it, but uh, we don't have time of use here in Pennsylvania, and uh, you know with with the solar, so it, it, it's really not an issue here. I, I can't speak for. Uh, Jersey or anybody else, at least in Pennsylvania. Right now, it's not a question. Okay, thanks. That's that's all I have. Okay. I have a question. Bruce, maybe you can comment on the importance of the regularity and standardization of the equipment in relation to training the masses of electricians we're going to need to install all the solar plus storage. Uh, 
It's a, it's a, it's, it's a lifesaver. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be so much easier. Um, I was truly worried about where they were going to get qualified people to do these installations. But now that I see what they're doing and I see that so many things are built right into the systems, it's just going to be so much easier to get people properly trained. And because they'll become like cars, uh, I use cars, you know, like Chevy, they'll be model specific systems. Uh, people can be trained, you know, they'll be better trained people. Like right now, if a problem happens and I would get called out, I could go out there and the equipment that they had could be equipment I didn't even know existed. <laughs> so then there I am, I'm getting out, you know, installation manuals and I'm having to educate myself there before I can work on it because it's different than anything I've worked on before. But these standardization packages, they'll have technicians that are trained in those packages. And, you know, the other part, there, there's a couple things. Uh, one is almost like a, a psychological thing that we've talked about over the years, uh, especially with older electricians, is that you're set up that everything flows from the grid back to the back to the loads in the house. and and. Basically, when you put in the battery storage thing, you've got a grid going in reverse and uh, people have to uh, wrap their heads around it. And it's different from what they've done every day for the last 20 years. And uh, you, you have to, to really kind of slow down and think. And, and that's, uh, that's kind of an interesting thing, but, but you actually run, you know, and, and maybe it's getting better now, but there's a lot of resistance from electricians about, you know, trying to do something new. And the, the other part too is, is that these uh, systems have become, the controllers have become much more sophisticated. So before, you know, you could plug your system in, you'd watch your meter go backwards and you were done for the day. Now you have to make sure there's a Wi-Fi connection and, you know, a lot of uh, communication stuff that needs to be hooked up. And so, again, you're looking at, at people that need to have uh, a lot more, uh, digital skills and what's out there now. I had a quick question. Um, I, could, uh, I just, I'm interested in whether there's any uh, uh, benefit or if it's possible to do the battery backup system first so that you can secure the benefits of having uh, the resilient backup and using grid for supply and adding the solar later, is that uh, something that people do? Uh, uh, yes, I, I actually I'm doing one now for some friends in Wisconsin. Uh, they got really freaked by the, the thing in Texas and they have a really uh, poor site for solar. So we're, you know, we're, there's a couple, couple three bat, uh, inverter manufacturers that will uh, work without solar. Uh, and then, you know, you got to go back and you have to size what, what are my loads, what's my kilowatt, my peak kilowatt, and then you can go from there. But yeah, the Solark makes one. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, Outback Power has a smaller one. And there's another company I was looking at. I don't remember their name right now. But there's, there's yeah. about uh, three companies, three or four companies that you can, that'll run without solar, just in a, a backup as you would and then you know again you have to you have to say okay well what do i what's it worth to me to do that or what are the, the ecological costs and you know just a lot of questions hey bill i have ron Silentano here i have a few things to um talk about one i want to add generac is another one by the way that uh, okay. provides. Yeah. it's uh, it's weird i talked to generac this week about generator support for their new uh, power cells and they don't offer it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> so they, it's you know, they just a generator company that doesn't offer <laughs> generator support to the units. But anyhow, they're working on this. <laughs> go, go figure. I want to uh, mention about the time of use. I'm actually, uh, PPNL has had a time of use rate for almost a year now, I think. And PPNL, I'd rather, and Pico will be um, offering a time of use rate very soon. So just to say that those options will be out there and 
for those of you on Pico with solar, I've done a lot of analysis on it because I, I was able to do a lot of analysis. You just, I had a lot of load shapes to work with and test on the time of use rate structure that Pico will, I think, be providing. And it really looks like anyone can benefit uh, monetarily, uh, you know, uh, financially on, on, on switching to time of use, except for those that have very small PV systems relative to large loads. So if you have that kind of, you know, real, you know, small system relative to your, your usage, that would um, not probably be economically viable to switch. But I did want to mention too, though, with regard to battery storage, it just came up the other day that someone was trying to take advantage of a new PV system installed in Pico territory with batteries, you know, it's a, you know, uh, Radian, you know, inverters, uh, Blue Planet, you know, uh, uh, lithium uh, iron phosphate, and they wanted to export from the batteries. Um, uh, and Pico basically said, no, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. And looking back at the, la at the law and seeing how it's, you know, phrased, it's kind of questionable. So that's one thing to talk about. But getting a little bit more to what you've been talking about here with the presentation with time of use um, and what Pico may be providing, uh, what they showed in their um, uh, uh, default supply uh, plan uh, rate uh, petition uh, last year, they had a off, an on-peak, off-peak, and a super off-peak. And the on-peak was two in the afternoon to six in the af at night. And then it goes to an off-peak. So you could take advantage of having batteries uh, whereby, you know, in the wintertime between maybe your four o'clock to to six o'clock, you can have your batteries now meet some of your load and to really take advantage of your of your um, on-peak um, and off-peak usage that way. There's a substantial price difference, at least in their in their example or exhibit that they had. It was like about over 19 cents um, a kWh for the on-peak price for electricity. And then it went down to like four cents and then three cents for a super off-peak, off-peak and super off-peak. So, you know, that's why it looked like it was very favorable economically to, to think about looking at, you know, doing um, time of use rate with solar in addition to even having batteries on top of that. Okay, yeah, and, and they, you know, again, the uh, Hawaii actually in some spots, they're, they're so overloaded that they're requiring people to uh, put in batteries and what they'll call self-consumption, that you can't sell it back to the grid. You have to, you know, use it yourself and, Basically, you you know you're off grid, but you do have the support of the grid if if you run low. Yeah. And now Europe uh, actually again has the same kind of uh, situation where they they dropped a lot of their uh, uh, you know their subsidies, and, and so if people are on their own, then they they're going to be looking at self consumption. Is, is there a life expectancy for the lithium batteries that you installed in, in this application? Uh, I, I can't remember what the warranty was. Hang on a second. Let me go to the sheet here. Uh, uh, 10 years or 10,000 cycles, they call it, with 80% uh, depth of discharge. So, and they all have uh, you know little monitors inside them that can be watched and stuff. Okay, um, is it possible to provide a small battery system for a moderate PV system that wouldn't power the system through the night, but allow the panels to produce power during the daytime? Did you get the question? I couldn't hear it. Could you repeat the question one more time, please? Yeah, is it possible to provide a small battery system for a moderate PV system that wouldn't power the house through the night but allow the panels to produce power during the daytime. Uh, oh, okay. So I, I guess you would be like in an off-grid situation then from, from what I understand with that. Yeah, it uh, sounds like it. Yeah, I mean, basically that's what, you know, folks have been doing for for 20 years living out in the hills. You know, you, you have maybe a, well, LED lighting has, has come in and there's just, uh, you know, so little of that energy use and, you know, refrigeration or, 
water becomes an issue. You can pump your water during the daylight and, uh, you know, just kind of watch your, yeah, I mean, again, it, it, it just becomes uh, a management question more than anything else. Uh, you know, years and years ago, I lived off grid and you can get by a kerosene refrigerator, a couple lamps and, uh, you know, a 12 volt car battery to play your cassette deck. So it, it, it just, uh, I mean, it, it just so much depends on, on what your expectations are and uh, what, you know, what you're willing to settle for. Okay, this, uh, what is the legal situation that offers Bronzeville to have microgrids? Uh, it was actually sponsored by Commonwealth Edison, the utility in Chicago. So yeah. they uh, they wanted to go ahead and, and just uh, start. And it's uh, it's interesting. That was uh, what they used to call. I grew up in Chicago, and that uh, was called Robert Taylor Homes. And they blew, they were uh, uh, I forget what you, like an apartment project thing, and uh, they ended up blowing up all the apartments because they just uh, unemployment was about ninety percent, and. Uh, you know, the, the apartments were just, nobody would even go in them to maintain them. So they uh, came back with this low to mid income mix and, uh, you know, threw in the microgrids on top of that. So. Uh, are, are battery storage costs expected to continue to drop dramatically? And will this be enough to affect adoption? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> it goes back to the, energy density i mean that's the first thing i think of is the is energy density of the battery uh right now lithium's best energy density is 400 kilowatts uh kilowatt hours per gram uh their theoretical best is 11 thousand so but i wouldn't hold my breath for that um, yeah, and, and you know, again, battery store, battery costs. I, I think that's something that's that it really surprises me. I, I think there's more people talking about it than what really happens. Uh, we buy AGMs from DACA. Uh, they didn't have a price increase last year because of COVID, but they're uh, they're coming up with one in June now. And uh, again, lead is a commodity. Uh, the price of lead is moving around, going up. So, you know, in the lead acid, I don't think you're really going to see um, much drops in pricing there. And the lithium, the prices are going down, but, you know, we're still looking at, if you compare them to an AGM, uh, two to three times the cost per kilowatt hour. So if you're not cycling it every day, um, you know, the AGMs have a, I think a three-year warranty. And, and, you know, I've had mine for 12 years. Other people have done at them for 10 years. So, I mean, they can sit around and do okay as long as they're not uh, being strained, uh, kind of like a bunch of old men or something. <laughs> I'd like to jog everybody's memory about solar panels. Uh, 10, 11 years ago, how, how much a solar panel cost per watt compared to what they cost now. It's the economy of scale. So there is hope with economies of scale too, for reducing the price of the batteries. Sounds like you're just not seeing it yet, though. I, I don't think, well, no, I think that, um, if look at Tesla, for instance, and, and they're, they're rolling out a bunch of price increases. Uh, the demand for their batteries, their power wall is, uh, it's the same battery they use in their cars, too, uh, is exceeding uh, what their production capacity is. So. Uh, Prices are going up. Okay. Since we had circled back to batteries, can I rephrase the question I had before about the battery? Because I don't think I quite understood the answer. Go ahead. All right. I understand, Bill, when you're talking about how much lifespan you've gotten out of the lead acid versus the lithium. I also understand the lead acids uh, or AGMs are about a three-year warranty versus a 10. I'm, when I talk about the lifespan of the battery, I'm not talking about how many recharge cycles or mean time between failure, or once they take a charge, how low they can go. I understand those differences. 
the question is in a real world scenario with the solar panel system, will, just to throw wild numbers out, will the AGM batteries most likely last about six years before you can start having failures and the lithium ions, you know, 15 years or whatever, because it affects with the recycling of the batteries, how we care about sustainable living on the planet, and also the great extra cost of the lithium batteries. So I'm, I'm looking for actually how many years the lithium batteries will hold up compared to the AGM? Uh, I think, well, the lithium, I think about 10 years is a standard warranty. Now, you know, if you're not cycling them, you know, that was their 10,000 cycles every day. Uh, time will tell how long they last. Uh, the, the lead acid stuff, I mean, it, it, in a sense, it's anecdotal. We haven't uh, really plotted them, but we certainly know you know, of our systems, we only had to change the batteries one time. And on, on my own system, we're looking at 12 years. And, and I know if we have an outage, I think we had one about a year ago, the, the batteries didn't provide as much uh, energy as they used to. But it, it's, uh, again, you know, it, it's how often and what you're, what you're willing to, to settle for. But it's, um, yeah, I, I, I just, you know, I, I just don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, you know what? What's a good answer to that question? I do. I do know. I have read one thing that is that the higher energy density lithium batteries have higher failure rates, and I think that that was part of what the question about the uh, solid state electrolyte was referring to. Too is the hopes that they've got real hopes for nanotechnology uh, to to help stop the breakdown of these higher density batteries. But if you're buying right now the higher density bat, uh, lithium batteries, that would be the ones that have a cobalt in them, because that's what the cobalt does: is it provides the higher density, will have a shorter life than maybe the ones with the iron phosphate, which uh, provides longer life. That's how they advertise. Does that address your question or give me any? Yes. Uh, yes, you answered it very well. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry about okay. that. Can I, yeah. uh, okay. the generator you. itself, when you're running the generator, let's assume you're running off natural gas or something like that. Um, obviously, it's a need at that time if the generator is your backup off grid. Um, but is it extremely cost prohibitive or is it not too much more cost than the electricity off the grid would be? Well, you mean in a cost per kilowatt hour or the initial costs or? Uh, yes, the cost per kilowatt I, hour. I guess if you, if you okay, that I, I, don't, I don't really know. I mean, I, I, I feel the grid is obvious, is they've got the, the amount of, you know, the scale of, is so much bigger that they can provide the, the electricity much cheaper than you can generate it uh, with a local generator. The other question, you know, the local, the small generators are uh, basically big polluters. There's, there's no, uh, you know, any kind of way to, to reduce the carbon dioxide uh, output on them. Uh, there's maintenance on them and uh, what, uh, yeah, so I, I don't think you're ever gonna run into a situation where it would be uh, Unless you know, cheaper to uh, run a generator than to, uh, than, you know, than to be tied into the grid. Now, long term, you know, your solar is going to win. You'll you will be running cheaper, but you're looking at you know, 10, 15 years with the batteries to uh, to recoup your costs. But you know, the fuel's free, and uh, it, it's always going to be that way. So uh, it's you know, if you're looking at a longer term investment, the, the solar is the way to go. Yeah, another thing about generators too, engine generators, is they, they have a life, a, a fairly, I think, shorter than most people are aware of life to them. And so if you get into an extended event like Sandy, and you turn on your generator and you run that generator day and night, it's not going to take too long for that generator to fail on you. So having a battery to fill up, turn off your generator, then use the power out of your battery, 
then your generator comes back on in those situations and kills it. That's actually extending the life of your generator too. I could put some numbers on that. Uh, I have a farm down in Southern Chester County. Um, we have multiple services coming in. I have a backup generator that puts out 13 kW. Uh, on one of the services, we lose power frequently, uh, extended up to five days. And I've had several generators over the years. I get about 10 years out of them, their Generax as backups. And I'm finding it costs about four times per kilowatt hour is what grid power costs from Pico. So that just gives you a rough number. They're propane based. We have thousand gallon propane tanks here. Are they uh, water cooled or air cooled generators? Air cooled. These are air cooled, they're not the real big ones. Yeah, and, and that, that's the other part. I think some people got caught with uh, Sandy uh, that, you know, the, the air cooled ones, Generac will actually tell you that they want you to limit how, how long you run those suckers before, uh, you know, you got to shut them down and let them cool off. So You're fun. supposed to shut them down once a day and uh, okay. check them. All but, right, thanks. Uh, so. doing, you're doing that, I've had no problems. Uh, and I've gotten up to 10 years out of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's another question. Does the utility need to be informed if a battery backup is added? Um, technically, they, they, they probably would, but if you're not, uh, if you're not changing your kilowatt output, you know, the number of modules that are in your house, uh, you know, you'd, you'd probably, you know, you'd just as uh, electrical contractors, we'd, we'd want to have the system inspected. Uh, you know, just just to resolve any any issues down the line of liability or something, but whether you need to talk to the utility about your batteries uh, legally, I'm sure you do. But whether it's worth it or not, I don't know. We uh, uh, I'll get in real quickly. Touch on this was uh, MedEd. Uh, we were doing this system there in uh, MedEd territory, and uh, people you know, providing the uh, interconnection agreement were completely clueless about, you know, how to how to deal with the batteries. And I found it really somewhat disconcerting that the utility was putting untrained people into these into these situations and uh, just coming up with some really wild uh, ideas and, and how you were supposed to do your interconnection. So, if, if you do have a battery backup system, an op, uh, optional power system to meet the, the National Electrical Code, you need to have posted like on your electrical meter so that if there's a fire and the firemen show up or <clears throat> whoever, that there's an optional system on site. We usually label, make a label says, uh, Caution, optional power system, battery-based power system on site. That way they know that even though they've killed the utility power to it, they can't just go in there, start spraying water anywhere they want to, cutting, swinging their ax wherever they want to because there still is live power on site. So they do need to be formed or, or informed. There needs to be a posting. Okay, uh, any thoughts about using NICAD batteries like the ones made by SAFT with 20 to 25 year performance? Um, no, I, I mean, I'm really not familiar with it. Uh, the word cadmium, again, just kind of like, oh man, what are we gonna do with this? How are we gonna recycle it? It's really, uh, hmm. you know, another uh, metal that you really don't learn. I, I guess I, I, I can't answer much more than that. Okay. All right. Well, that comes to the end of the questions that I have for my list. Um, I th we'll probably need to wrap up if we have one or two more questions. I think we can do that and then we'll, we'll uh, uh, end the meeting. Did anyone else have a, a question? Okay, I guess uh, that's it. Well, I want to thank everybody for taking time to uh, come and listen to us. I, I hope it's been some benefit to you, and uh, we, uh, we we really enjoy batteries and solar. <laughs>
Thanks, everybody. We, we look forward to seeing you uh, at the uh, next month on uh, May 25th, I believe it is. Uh, we'll hear about what's going on in Philadelphia with uh, solar there and the Solarize program and uh, green jobs uh, relative to uh, the solar industry. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, register, you can find us on the website at www.themorea.org. Thanks very much. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bruce. Appreciate it.